Hi, my name is Andy Robertshaw. I'm a military historian best known for the First World War. Um, and I'm standing in a replica trench at the Kent Showground on Deckling Hill here in Kent. Why am I stood in a trench like this? Well, I'm working as one of two partners in SEMA, the Centre for Experimental Military Archaeology. And the ridge that I'm on now has a, a very long history in terms of its military importance. It has a Roman signal tower that was discovered on the far side of the ridge. Three Mott and Bailey castles, including one that was built after the Norman Conquest by Bishop Odo, who was the Archbishop of Canterbury for William the Conqueror. It then becomes really not very important during the period of the English Civil War, although there is a battle at Maidstone not very far away. It really comes back as somewhere very important during the First World War. There's the connection. So where I'm standing now is actually on a ridge and that ridge runs basically north-south and it means that anybody approaching from that direction has a very, very big obstacle in the way. The Romans knew it was important they put a signal tower here. The Normans, after the Norman conquest, thought this is an important area. They built three Mott and Bailey castles on it, including one built by Archbishop Odo, who was the Archbishop of Canterbury, to William the Conqueror. Then really not much happens other than a battle in 1648 in Maidstone during the Civil War. But on the outbreak of the First World War, and this is the connection to where we are now, it was decided it was possible for the German Imperial Navy to get their fleet basically into the Thames estuary, the Medway, up the River Swale, probably would be sunk, but they could get soldiers ashore, in which case they could come up and over this ridge and attack the important naval port, which is Chatham behind me, from the rear. So this becomes the Chatham land front. They build an airfield, which is Royal Naval Air Service, um, Detling, just behind there as well. After the First World War, largely abandoned. But in 1938, this becomes RAF Detling, really important in the Battle of Britain, and once again, a stop line in case of Nazi invasion. So one of the things we want to do with SEMA, the Centre of Experimental Military Archaeology, is to reflect the various phases of development and use of the ridge. Now, clearly, we're in a First World War trench. Why build this first? Well, the answer is, frankly, it's relatively easy to build. And the other thing is, we're actually drawing on our experience on other sites. This area will be used for experimentation. It will be used for teaching and currently we've got school groups coming through and we have the army coming through, partly because they can't get to France and Belgium because of Covid, but they like coming here for what they call the realities of war. The other thing that we're doing here as well is making TV programmes and the occasional film. And what we've got really is a situation where my background is one that's very, very unusual. Now, the project isn't just about me, it's about a lot of partners. But I am the only person that I'm aware of, for example, who's a historian who's worked with archaeologists on the Western Front. My fellowship of the Society of Antiquaries is in recognition of that archaeological work. So when I'm working here with a team of people building trenches, Yes, I'm using the manuals. Yes, I'm using the photographs, but I'm also informed by what I've seen at Forward Cottage at Ypres or down at Corselet on the Somme where we found trenches, but also, of course, human remains. Now, we're not going to get them here, but it means it informs what we do. I've also been approached by filmmakers such as Steven Spielberg and Sam Mendes to work on Warhorse with trenches and also then 1917 with trenches. And oddly enough, Peter Jackson then came to ask me for advice when he put his piece of edited film together because I've been working very extensively on Jeffrey Malins, the cinematographer, and also working on J.B. McDowell, the people that film the song. So when I'm looking at this system here, I'm using all those levels of information to ensure that it's as accurate as possible, but also reflects the film of the period, the photographs of the period, and of course, we, it has as many differences to make it interesting. The fact is that the trenches, 
fascinating though they are, are a little bit boring if you're not careful because a fire bay like this is matched by a fire bay by a fire bay by a fire bay. But actually what goes on in here is about life. And what we want to do with SEMA is yes, to contemplate building much bigger trench system, build a German trench system, basically have a no man's land. Later on, work on building some gabions and fascines, defensive structures that were used actually in the basically late medieval period right through to the 19th century, made from wood and filled with earth to resist cannon shot and muskets, possibly to build, we hope, a replica Roman signal tower, because there was one, as I've already said, and then anything else that comes up. But the fact is that we're then going to be looking at using those structures to show how soldiers and civilians would live in a structure like that. And what's happening is because we've actually gone quite public about what we're doing, people are coming forward and saying, ah, would you like a stove for your replica dugout? One of the things that happened last winter was that we discovered that on a beach at Botany Bay in Kent actually were the sections of a First World War pillbox called a Maya, Ma, Moya pillbox. And we went to see it with, with people who spotted it and made a, a short piece from Meridian TV about it. We then got sponsorship basically from a transport company to deliver 50 pieces of 1917, 1918 pillbox to this site. And at the moment, we're looking possibly at another pillbox we found, which looks to be under threat. So it appears that the site is, yes, reconstructions, replicas, but it also is becoming a bit of a home for what we might call orphan heritage. You know, the stuff that doesn't normally have a home, most people wouldn't want it. Most museums would say, well, what, what do we do with a, a concrete pillbox? What do we do with this? Well, we can house it here. And what we can do is actually with the trench system is reflect what happened here during the First World War, but also what happened on the other side of the channel in France and Belgium. How does that work? Well, the answer is quite simply, when they built the Chatham land front, which faces that way, they built trenches. And the people that built them used the techniques that we're using here, including the, the building of here, pieces of, of wattle hurdling to hold it up. We know that from the photographs. They then used steel and corrugated iron and they used sandbags. But the guys that built it here then went to France and Belgium and used exactly the same techniques. So we have actually gone to tip our hat to the Great War by calling our trench system, it has to have a name, Railway Wood. Why Railway Wood? Well, I used to teach geography. This area of soil is clay, so is Railway Wood near Ypres, unlike the, the chalk of the Somme. And the key thing about that, of course, it's a wood, hence railway wood. And what we're going to do is, would you believe, the chairman here of the managing body that runs the showground said to us the other day, would you like some railway sleepers? And we said, yes, because actually we don't have a railway near at hand, but we know from photographs of the real railway wood, they stripped out the railway from Ypres up to Rullier, and they used it to build structures. So by building it correctly, we're using the correct techniques, we are more than reflecting the reality, and also we're taking our visitor through the fact that a trench system very similar to this was built only a few hundred yards away, and the men that built it learned their techniques before they went to France and Belgium. We kind of imagine, I think, that people arrive in France and Belgium and they go, OK, build a trench. Well, that's not what happens. They actually learn those techniques in the UK. And we know from excavations, including those done by Wessex Archaeology, that training trenches are incredibly important. But they are training the soldiers in the techniques in building them, but also something I said earlier on, also how to live in it. Where do you go to the toilet? Where do you get any shelter if the weather's bad? How do you cook? How do you do your routine? Because frankly, on guard duty at night, you can probably do it well for about an hour. 
then you'll be actually resting, then you'll be working. Basically, you work a bit of a sweat up, you're fully awake, then you go back for another hour on guard duty. And what we want to do, as part of everything else that we can possibly do in this trend system, is yes, guide groups through in daylight, but also with certain groups, say, do you want to try a few hours or longer living in a trench? We did this a while ago, and we actually had a journalist from the Sun newspaper came, and we, we dressed him in great war uniform. He was quite cynical about it, to be honest. And I can't remember his name. I, I wish I could. But the first thing I did was I gave him a set of identity tags, which were identical to the ones used in the Great War. And he looked at them, and he said, oh, that's my name. I went, that's not your name. That's the name of somebody that served in the Great War in the Lincolnshire Regiment. And he said, I come from Lincolnshire. I went, yes, I know you do. This is one of your relatives ID tags. I've copied it. You're wearing it because you're remembering him by simply wearing that uniform. This isn't dressing up. This is an experience. Now, we're not going to blow you up or shoot you or gas you. But what we can do is make you experience life in the trench. And during his 12 hours, and he did 12 hours working with a group of people also in uniform. He came and I had had a little rest. I had a, a charcoal cooking stove and I'd heated up a tin of baked beans. Now, they were clearly modern baked beans with a First World War label on it. And I'd opened it up in the approved style. We know how they did it because archaeologically you find them. They basically use a period type tin opener. You cut round it, it's pretty crude. Very often you cut your fingers, you fold it back, and then you hold the tin over your charcoal or fire and stir it. And he came off his guard duty and it was cold, it was below freezing and foggy, and he came into part of the trench. Someone else took over on guard duty and I said, do you want some baked beans? And he went, I don't like baked beans. I went, doesn't matter. These are hot, you're cold, take it, get your spoon out. He had a spoon in his pocket and he started eating it. And he went, oh, they're wonderful. And I went, what do you think? He went, hang on, this trench life isn't about dying or being shot or being gassed. It's just about staying alive. I said, it's also about comradeship. It's about your mate heating up some food for you or giving you a cup of tea when you come off guard duty and you doing the same for them. Well, what you can learn is the realities, the minutiae of what you do in a trench. People will say, okay, there's a dugout around the corner. Do the soldiers sleep in there at night? Two things. One, you work all night, you're on guard duty all night, and you have periods of rest all night because you can't repair your trench in daylight. You can't put up the barbed wire in daylight. Nighttime is not for sleeping. So when you read in school textbooks, the soldiers wake up in the morning. No, they've been awake all night. Oh, okay. So where do they sleep? Do they sleep in the dugout? No, the dugout's for signalers and officers. So where do the men sleep? Well, if they sleep, they sleep in the afternoon because that's the warmest time of the day and they sleep there. You basically sit on the fire step and you sleep. You bring your legs in because otherwise you trip your mates up and they get really angry. So how much sleep do you get? Possibly three, four, five hours if you're lucky. And then at night with an hour to rest, you probably won't go to sleep much, but you will have a bit of a rest, which means that five days in here is all you can do because at the end of five days, you are so tired as to be almost dangerous. And the army knew that. They will take you away for possibly another 20 days before you come back to your front line. And then people are going to go, oh, I can't see anything other than trees in the sky. Yeah, that's your life as a soldier. The only time you can see out to no man's land is night time when you can risk standing up here, looking over the, oh, might you get shot? Yes, you might get shot. Why? Because you've got to stand head and shoulders above our parapet there, because otherwise you can't see and you can't hear. Oh, and by the way, if you've got big ears like me, it's a problem. Why? Because you can't wear anything over your ears. You can't wear a scarf or a balaclava, which means your ears get bloody cold. And just, an hour or so of walking around, chatting, asking questions. And very often we have people in uniform in the trenches who know their stuff. 
People have a revelation about what goes on, about where you cook, where you sleep, what the, the toilet's like. And then we've got the fact that actually in your unit of soldiers are people who have really, really exciting jobs. Snipers, we know about snipers, of course, that there might be one in a hundred. How about the idea that every unit will have a latrine orderly? What do they do? Well, basically, their job is to make sure the toilet, the latrine, is emptied. And then basically the container, the latrine bucket, is washed out with Jay's fluid and then it's replaced. And that job means that people in the trench don't die of disease because they don't catch them. He makes sure that it's actually fly proof. So in summer, you don't get flies landing on what's in the toilet and then coming and landing on your food because otherwise you get outbreaks of dysentery. But of course, no one's ever heard of those people. One of the things that we've been able to do is work in partnership with the University of Kent, but also very, very importantly with Wessex Archaeology. And Wessex were able to do archaeology on Salisbury Plain, chalk trenches, by the way, and they were used for training. But they found many, many finds, artifacts from that period when it was being built and then used by soldiers. And what we were able to do is compare their dug up examples with examples from my private collection, just to see what that told us about the experience of living in a trench. Andy, I've brought with us today some artifacts from a First World War training trench yeah. in Wiltshire, and we've got some slightly better preserved modern equivalents. Yeah. Can we talk first about this? What are we looking at here? That is a mess tin that's been in the ground quite a long time. It's actually, it's a pre-war one, I can tell you now, um, but that's what a soldier carries his food in it, and he also cooks in it, boils his water for his tea or his coffee, um, and that one's seen better days. That's what it should be. And this like. is what it should look like. Absolutely, but if a soldier lost that, he would have to replace it, it'd go to the quartermaster, lost my mess tin, right, you're gonna pay for that one, the one you lost and your new and one, your new one. Oh, no. so you it's a double whammy if you lose it and obviously he couldn't cook so he would be pretty annoyed and uh, so who was doing the cooking in the trenches soldiers normally at home at least are cooking for themselves if they're down in the camp close by it's been done for them they've got cooks but if you're in the trenches to learn how to look after yourself in the front line you cook for yourself and eating off plates like this well this is sort of a canteen thing rather than oh, okay. a trench so frankly someone's been a bit naughty i suspect it could be the same guy that lost the mess tin because he's actually stolen it from the canteen. This is not issued to a soldier. This is very much something that would be in the YMCA canteen or something like that. And this chutney, what, why is there chutney in a trench? Because the food, there's lots of it. it. It's normally bread, biscuit, vegetables, lots of meat. But this is, of course, a bit more tasty. The food is monotonous. It's the same every day. Therefore, anything, whether it's sauce, like the HB sauce there, or A1 sauce, it's mustard, it's pickle, anything just to make it taste a bit better. To bring some flavour and a bit of life to it. Absolutely, yes. And why have we got these golden syrup tins? What are these here well, for? It's very, very popular stuff. I mean, it, it's nice anyway if you put, put that on your porridge, but the main thing is that the lid just flips off. Uh, if you open a tin of normal uh, jam, you've got to open it up with a, a, a jackknife or with a, a tin opener, it's then open. Within minutes, you've got ants in it, you've got flies in it, horrible. Whereas this, you can close the lid down and there's lots of energy. It's, you know, it's literally, it's, it's virtually liquid sugar, isn't it? And then actually this one here has been converted to make it into a little cooker so you can actually heat your food up over it by actually using uh, melted candle wax on sandbag. And to provide a bit of heat for your hands. And Absolutely, or just get a brew going. And what were they brewing in their mugs? Tea, very often, that was the, the, the standard. Coffee also was available, and it comes in a one pint. So that you've got a one pint there, that's my modern one pint. It's quite a lot of tea. A pint of tea. Absolutely, and it's gonna have sugar in it, and it's also gonna have condensed milk. So for our taste, or my taste at least, very, very sweet. And was it tea as we know it today? Yes, it was... very much it is. But normally, of course, what you have to do is that it's not in tea bags. It's loose tea, and I was taught by an old soldier from the First World War. What he did, he used to, used to break a match off and drop it into his tea. It attracts the tea leaves, and then he'd flick the tea leaves out with a spoon. That's a little <laughs> trick for you <laughs> if you ever have tea with leaves in it. And the corned beef we're looking at there, the corned beef tins, yep. 
What is corned beef? It's preserved meat. I mean, and that's exactly how it opens, isn't it? You simply have a little key on the side, you wind around, tip it out, and then you eat it. And that could either be eaten in a sandwich or it goes into a stew. And you've got what's left over after you've opened one of those tins up. And again, high energy. Yeah, but the problem with it is, with this kind of thing, lots and lots of protein. One of the problems the soldiers got, particularly early in the war, were boils, because they had so much meat in their diet. So they actually reduced the meat, not because of rationing. And the whiskey bottle we've got at the end. Yeah. Is that a normal thing to find in a trench? It, we find them in trenches, certainly, even at the front, but very much something that an officer would have. If you were found in the trenches to have brought alcohol in, unless you were given express permission to have it, you'd be in serious trouble because a sentry that drinks too much of this probably is going to fall asleep or be drunk. He's which not would be keeping worse. a lookout. He's not keeping a lookout, and that's dangerous. And were soldiers given an alcohol ration at all? In cold and wet weather, you get a small quantity of rum, high-proof rum, first thing in the morning after you finish your nighttime routine. Thank you. One of the things that I did when I was director of the Royal Logistic Corps Museum was I was able to use some record books which were used in training by soldiers who became cooks uh, because the RLC now have chefs in the First World War they were called cooks and one soldier joined the Royal Sussex Regiment he went for a training course probably no more than two weeks and then he was then a cook on the Western Front sadly was killed in the Battle of Passchendaele, the third Battle of Ypres. But we know from his records and from others that what they're doing is they're back there, they're behind the lines effectively, possibly in the second or third line trenches, and they're making soup and stew and coffee and tea, and it's been brought forward. And when you've got that, you start to realize that some of the jobs here are not the ones you see in the movies. They're not just snipers and bomb throwers and mortar men. And actually, they're the latrine orderlies, they're the, the cooks, they're the people that move all the gear around. And someone was saying the other day about how does the food get to the trenches? You know, do you go back and get it? No, you don't. Every day, sandbag is produced containing enough food for six soldiers. And then the sandbag is incorporated into your trench. So that's quite a useful way of doing it, which means that every day you've got your tin food coming up. You've got bacon coming up. You've got cheese. You've got jam. You've got margarine. You've got salt and pepper. You've got all sorts. In fact, the food, there's lots of it in the trenches. The problem with it, it's very, very boring. So archaeologically, we find lots and lots of glassware where soldiers have been able to go to the canteens, because in the training camps and behind the lines there are the canteens, buy their HP sauce, buy their Baird's pickle, and then use it in the trenches. And one of the curious things about certainty is that when we first did our first archaeology on the Western Front, we found lots of glassware. And we were adjacent to what had been used as a dugout. It was a cellar under a house on the Somme. And visitors to our site would tell us with great certainty, ah, cellar, you see, that's used by officers, and they have lo lovely food, it's marvellous. And that's why there's all that glassware. And you can't prove them wrong till you do 27 projects. And at the end of 27 projects, you're able to say, well, I'm sorry to tell you, you're wrong. We find glassware everywhere, even if there is no officer's dugout, it actually is, you know, everywhere because soldiers make their food more interesting and when you then get modern soldiers coming through they'll say oh that's really funny because actually our ration packs have a little bottle of tabasco sauce for exactly the same reason to make it interesting and what you can then do is make that connection between people over a hundred years ago and the modern soldier basically saying rations are okay they're boring it's never actually changed so really what we're trying to do is a nuts and bolts approach. And what we'd like to then do is possibly build on site a little piece of 17th, 18th century fortification called a bastion. Again, dug earth. But what we want to do is to use the tools and the techniques they would have used. Baskets to move the earth, wooden wheelbarrows, possibly even trying to build a little bit of Roman ditch so we could just see how long it would take. Um, I've got an idea how long it might take on soft ground, but this soil here is awful because it's full of flint. 
The question would be, if you're meant to be able to dig a marching camp every night, every night the Romans are marching, they build a camp if there's nowhere to go to the safe, well, how long would it take to build that just so we can inform what we're going on? And I was talking earlier on to a, a colleague about York. And as a, a young student, I actually ended up teaching how Mott and Bailey castles were built. And we already know that they built three here. If you build a Mott and Bailey castle and you build it, I suppose, just out of the local material, in this case, clay and flint, all that would happen is it would collapse. And I was lucky enough, actually, as a student at what was then the College of Ripon and York St. John, to meet people at York Castle Museum who said, ah, yeah, the technique for building a Mott and Bailey Castle is the Mott, the mound as it's called, isn't just built by piling up earth. It doesn't work. It collapses like a big plum pudding. Instead, there's actually layers of wicker work inside it, and it's alternate wicker work, clay, or local loam mixed with rock so it doesn't collapse. And the question would be is, could we get permission, I think we might do, to just building not an entire mot, and that's, that's a, a task and a half, but just building a small section of mot to see how that would work and how long it would stay up. And then being able to say, well, in the First World War, they're using the wicker here, the hurdling, as a vertical surface, the Normans are using it horizontally to build up their mounds so they've got an observation position on which they can build their tower to be able to dominate the local area. So in many, many ways, what we're trying to do is to use everything we can archaeologically, historically, and of course, experimentally. And one of the experiments we did just the other day was that we saw on um, basically, I'll be honest, YouTube, a piece of film of somebody cooking a First World War meal. I have done it a couple of times myself, but this one was a demonstration of what not to do. Basically, they took a, a mess tin, a D-shaped mess tin, they put it over a fire and they left it while they chopped their food up. And you could see it going blue. Basically, if it had been a real one, it actually, the tin would have melted. But we know from accounts that the soldiers said your bacon was really important first thing in the morning. And the smell of cooking bacon was one of those the most evocative smells people remember from the Great War. But the question is, how do you cook it? We've already said if you put it in the mess tin, which is very thin metal, and you simply heat it up, pop your bacon in, all that will happen, it'll end up covered in tin. But we know that they used to use their entrenching tools. Basically, a small shovel with a hole through it for a handle, stick that in the side of the trench, clean it up, of course, then heat that up. It's obviously solid metal. It's a cast piece of metal. Get that up to temperature with a nice brisk fire. Pop your bacon on, turn it over a couple of times. It's cooked. And then just over there, that's exactly what we did. But to make it historically accurate, we put people over there and said to them, if you see smoke, that would indicate to you exactly where they were cooking breakfast. And what would follow in reality would have been a couple of mortar bombs that would just sport your breakfast. So we didn't exactly make it a moment of jeopardy, but we said to the guys here, you can make your breakfast by all means. And I tried it, by the way, it was very nice. But if they see it and they know where you are, you've got to stop and move somewhere else. And you go, oh, that's a bit of an experiment, isn't it? It is. Is it going to magnificently change our understanding of the First World War? No, it won't do. But what it will do is help rebuild the unrecorded bits of the experience. Because when people were interviewed in the 60s and 70s, it was like, what was it like in battle? Were you in a gas attack? Were you blown up? All of that stuff. Nobody ever said to soldiers, not that I'm aware of, how did you cook your breakfast in the morning? What did he use as toilet paper? 
what was it like to be in a trench for five days in the middle of summer because we're obsessed with rain we imagine it rained all the time like front well it didn't do what's it like down here when it's 32 degrees and blistering heat where what shelter is there the answer is none at all so what we're trying to do with all of this is to build up a tapestry Think of it like an onion, you know, that actually we're all familiar with the Great War through that outer skin of, you know, all quiet on the Western Front or the over the top sequence in War Horse. What we're not familiar with is just how mundane it could be. I mean, at least one veteran of the Great War said his war was 90% bored stiff. 9% frozen stiff, 1% scared stiff. And the great danger of looking at the First World War through that outer skin of 1% is you don't see everything else. And what we'd like to people to do here is to come into this trench, walk through, to be able to understand what's going on by talking to people. There, there are no veterans left, so they, they have to be what we might call interpreters. But also to understand the experience through the smell, the jay's fluid from the latrine, the cooking bacon, the, the, the cup of tea, you know, that's just been made by a soldier in the trench. And then watching somebody looking through the periscope, having a look themselves, how much can you see? And quite quickly, people start populating their own mind with just the reality of the experience. It's no longer a question of imagination, it's actually based on experience. This is what we want here. Not the imagined war, not the imagined Roman soldier or the imagined Norman, but actually the reality of their experience, whether it's building or living, but not, and not dying, because that's not what we're about.